Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk in 20 minutes about some of the problems, I, design problems I see in town centres and suggest ways forward how urban design can tackle some of these problems. I think many of the problems are generic and apply to, to a, a great number of centres. Um, if I could just change the running order of my talk um, following, uh, following Simon's, I, I could start here and pick up um, where we are. Um, Simon mentioned vitality and viability, and I think in design terms I might rephrase that to saying urban designers are primarily involved in shaping urban form. We're primarily involved in the shape of the, shape of the city, the shape of the town. And in tackling the form of the city, we are really trying to impact and affect um, social and economic outcomes. Well, that maybe is another way of putting vitality and viability, but it's a way of people having safe, attractive, exciting, stimulating environments, and also that the town centres are economically successful. But we can't get at that directly. As urban designers, we work on the physical form of the town. And overlaid on that, which is largely what Simon was talking about, we've got policy and management. So policy and management decisions will attenuate uh, some of the problems and try and find solutions where the form of the town centre isn't working as well. And if I can just go back a slide and say, what do I mean by the form of a town centre, which is subject all by itself, and I kind of represent this in three boxes. I say the underlying uh, uh, decision or, or, or factor about town centres is the, is the pattern of movement. How people move around a town centre on foot is the underlying determinant of how that centre works. Everything starts with movement. And from movement, different uses, different land uses will locate uh, within, within the movement structure as is appropriate. So if you have streets with very high footfalls, that's going to attract retail uses. If you have places in that movement structure with very low footfalls, it may attract residential. Residential is an odd one because some people like to be in a buzzy central place, others like to be in a quiet place. But uses will locate according to the movement pattern. And those two factors together, I suggest, will determine density. So if you've got high footfalls um, attracting lots of uses, then the density is going to go up. So density is really a product of movement and use. So that's, those is just a quick background assumption of what I'm going to talk about in terms of urban form. Now, I'm going to suggest that the late 20th century created many problems in town centres, really 20, 20 years, 75 to 95, caused huge problems in a great many town centres. I would say in most towns, what you have up until about 1960 you can regard as assets and a great deal of what you get between the 70s, the 80s, going into the 90s and still happening today in some cases are very often creating problems. Not always, there's some excellent schemes coming out of that time, but we also have a heritage of problems to deal with. So what are those problems? I'm going to look at three centres, three town centres, um, to illustrate them. Uh, this, they're both, all three are projects on which we have worked. The first one is in Poole in Dorset. On the left you can see Poole 1970. If you can see the high street at the centre of the scheme there, very busy, thriving high street. Um, it probably lacked what, what is now called a retail offer. So how do we get the retail offer? Income Arndale centres. And if you look at the figure ground plan on the right, this mall that goes through the centre is right on the high street. That's where the high street was. The shopping centre is plonked right on the top to catch the maximum footfall through the centre. And at either end of that shopping centre, there's a door, two leaves, six foot wide, six foot high. Um, it may be kept open at night by virtue of a Section 106 agreement. It might be locked. I don't know. I wouldn't want to walk through there. Um, and hope that there's somebody watching on CCTV if anything should go amiss. Inside that environment, ah, aerial view here, this is, this, 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 this is a beauty. Um, <clears throat> here's the bottom of the high street. That you can figure where the centre of that mall is going through there and where it picked up the high street at the top. 
You've also got the road system going round. If you didn't get a relief road in your town centre, you were lucky. If you, had a, if you had instead a high street which was engineered to improve the flow of vehicles, it's something you can maybe do something about. So you've got the shopping centre, typically plonked on with a maximum footfall. You've got a fast road system prioritising vehicles. And of course, there's a few landmark buildings. There's a nice one here, um, top left, that's a bank, a large bank HQ. Does anybody guess what the bank is? The architect thought, it would, wouldn't it be cool if he or she designed the plan in the shape of the company's logo? It's NatWest, it's the NatWest logo, and they've actually built it. So this is what you get inside. Now, maybe I'm being really unfair here and picking a, not a very nice shopping center and a much better interior than this. But this is what I see going around the country. I see many centers that look like this. I once heard um, a talk where a promoter of a shopping centre said um, there are 112 bad days in England uh, and that's why you have to cover shopping areas in. And the best response I've heard to that came from Jan Gerl, a Danish urbanist, who said, well, if that's the case, if you build a shopping centre, you get 365 bad days. <laughs> Um, another quick case study, this is Banbury Market Town in North Oxfordshire. This plan is late 19th century. Uh, you can get a, an idea of the urban form, the high street, the marketplace to the east on the right hand side of the slide. Um, and at the top, the former site of the castle. New shopping centre bolted on here, just a huge extension on the northern side, all under one roof, mopped up the footfalls, internalised them. And of course, local distinctiveness is it's not forgotten. This is called the Castle Centre. On the previous slide in, 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 in Poole, the, the, the token gesture to local distinctiveness was the Dolphin Centre. We're on the sea, we'll call it the Dolphin Centre. Um, this is Oxford. Um, late Victorian map. Oxford is essentially a crossroads, which, which you can see top right. This sector here in the southwest has been the subject of much planning thought, but in the 70s and 80s, the neighborhoods of St. Thomas's and St. Ebbs were raised to the ground, uh, housing moved out, inner ring road partially went in, shopping center was built. And if I zoom in on that, if high street is sort of up Top, top right, coming down Castle Street. This is the outline of the uh, shopping centre that was built, the Westgate Centre, overlaid on the street pattern that existed. Um, this is sort of inherited today. This is the existing shopping centre. Um, this is the West Gate into historic Oxford. This is the West Gate. This is where the West Gate was. Um, local distinctiveness, what did they call this? the Westgate Centre. Uh, what happened to the topography? Well, vehicles are being pedestrianised, so this is what happens to pedestrians. Uh, here you see the back of it, the, 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 the shopping centre can only work on one level, so it doesn't relate to the topography. This is the service back end. Uh, fortunately, there's a better proposal now about to replace that old centre. It's significantly better. Uh, this aerial view shows the footprint of the centre. You can see how it se se um, separates and cuts off movement east to west. And what the, the new developer has done, or the new developer scheme, is to greatly improve east-west movement across that. So I think it's what we're going to get in Oxford is a lot better. Um, but it is, I would argue, not what the starting point should be. So, what has happened in many towns? Um, first of all, you've had a prioritization favoring traffic over people. You've had land assembly, which has assembled a small plot pattern and land ownerships into big chunks so you can build big schemes. Housing has largely been moved out. Uh, streets have been lost. If you measure the amount of public streets you had in most towns uh, in 1950, 1960, and compare it to today, there is a loss of public realm. There is car parking that has been shoehorned in inappropriately where now we might be looking to put the funding into public transport instead. 
And very typically, there's a, there's a practical problem of confusion between backs and fronts. You've got back ends of shopping centres because they've been internalised with internal mouths, and at the backs, you've got inactive edges uh, fronting important lines of movement. Why did it happen? What, what were the vested interests? Well, the developers' interests were to maximise profits on a particular area of land rather than maximizing value over a wider area and using the scheme to generate value over a wider area. Um, they are very easy in operational terms um, and for many operators and store owners they often have the choice you move into the center uh, and you pay the high rent or you, you tough it out in the high street which has often become skid row in many areas. The local authorities um, very often, and I say the majority of cases, own land on which these centres were built. And it's the state's department not talking closely enough to the planning department um, and doing deals which were not for the long-term good of the town. Ditto the interests of the landowner. For the architectural firms, the big firms who specialised in these schemes, they are huge jobs. And in all, I think I'd summarise it as saying it was a way of solving what seemed to be problems of traffic, of parking, of bringing retail into the town in a very heavy-handed way. It was a way of tackling the sort of complexity of problems and solutions that we should be thinking of that Simon was, was touching on, but there was a lack of skills when that was happening. So, you've got the large monolithic structures, pedestrian movement channeled um, through internal environments, uh, the frontage problems, single-use blocks created, privatized public space. If it's, uh, there are some public spaces that work well under cover, but I think there's a limit to how much of a town centre you can put under cover and expect it to work well. A less flexible building stock, these, the, 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 these centres have a lifespan of 25, 30 years, then the whole lot has really got to be replaced. It isn't possible to accommodate incremental change. They, they're, they're, they're amortised. Um, once it's possible to intensify the development and recoup a better, better profit, it's whole-scale redevelopment of that quarter of the town and arguably a poor environmental quality. So what's, what's the alternative? Um, and I applaud um, Simon for showing all your, all your slides were outdoors, every, sing, every, every, every single one. And I think that's, um, that, that, that is a starting point, that if we can foster the design of shopping streets and mixed uses rather than centres, it's a helpful way forward. That's not to say there's not a role for shopping centres and malls and arcades but you don't give over a quarter or a half or even more of your town centre to that particular solution. And I'm going to propose ten sort of key urban design principles. Uh, the first one is really trying to create or retain a finer grain and a smaller block size. Um, this little sketch was done by a former colleague, Paul Cooper, for what could have been Telford uh, Newtown's town centre um, at Oaken Gates, but many centres, certainly in London boroughs, retain an older building stock along the high street and that's a really valuable resource to have. And I think uh, the older building stock should be cherished, they've got a finer grain and are able to accommodate a wide range of uses. Um, secondly, to recognise topography and make use of level changes. If new design can reveal the underlying fall of the land, even, even one, two, three metres is important. Don't seek to deck things out and, uh, and, and, and cover up the underlying ground form. Thirdly, ensure that you've got frontages, particularly on ground floors, that are transparent with uses behind so that you get natural surveillance and you get activity along the street. And the one saving grace of the uh, scheme in Banbury, which I showed you earlier, is that it's inside this block. The uh, the architects and developer had several goes at designing an elevation which all failed the county council uh, planning committee and in the end uh, Philip Ofer who was an urban designer with Oxford uh, Shear County said why don't you keep the old shop units around the edge integrate them in the design of the scheme <clears throat> and you get a return frontage onto the market square so the market square has been retained that could have been a backside it could have been a blind wall um, that, would, that would have killed that square off 
how can you get users to extend into the evening? If it's a busy, bustling, thriving street in the daytime because it's retail only, what happens at night when the shops close, particularly if there's no residential uses there? Is it possible to get evening uses, the evening economy, located in ways that will keep that town lively after the retailers finish for the day? Uh, this is from a piece of uh, research, research work that we're doing in the practice, which my colleague uh, Conrad is here today um, working on, and we're looking at, at Oxford. This is actually mapping the public realm in the city, and it's taking account of a, a number of factors, including active edges and transparency at ground floor level, how pedestrian space is prioritized, and visibility aspects. And it's attempting to map um, how attractive that is for pedestrians, the quality of the public realms. The darker the color, the more attractive it is. And the interesting point is that in being attractive for pedestrians, it's also attractive for investors. And the hot red areas on there are also the hottest um, places for retailers to invest. So it's really a win-win situation here. The other half of this picture is to look at what happens at Nighttime, and at nighttime it's very different. This nighttime uh, graph, the lighter areas are the most attractive for pedestrians, and they are, sorry, this is gone from not working to getting very twitchy. Um, the lighter areas are the most attractive to pedestrians, often because there's other people around and people feel safe at night. But it's a very different picture at daytime and nighttime. And this, we think, is a, a, an interesting technique to actually show potential investors and also lo work with lo local authorities in, in ensuring that the, the streets in the town are attractive pedestrians at both daytime and nighttime and also uh, they are attractive to investors and developers. Um, the fifth point um, I wanted to make is about bringing uses back into town centres. Many uses, including local authority offices, have been pushed out of town. Many public buildings have been moved out of the centre, which is a great pity. Um, these sketches also, which we prepared for, for Oxford, were showing how some of those uses can be brought back in. So public functions back in the town centre. Publicly owned public, pu public realm. I think there is a, a growing trend to privatize what was public realm, um, seeing it as an opportunity to get the public realm well managed and well maintained. I think there's a very strong argument for keeping public realm in public ownership. Um, there's ways that uh, investment can be brought in to improve the management and maintenance of it. As soon as it's privatized, you have real problems of keeping it open, keeping it, uh, keep, keeping it managed, even through Section 106 agreements. Um, the Victorian arcades <coughs> are privately owned. Uh, they are an exception, but those arcades work in a particular way. They're not on primary movement routes. They're on the secondary movement routes. They provide shortcuts between blocks. If you look at abroad, say it, it, Italy, Italy, the Galleria, most Italian Galleria are in public ownership. The, 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 the movement routes through those Galleria are publicly owned. It's part of the adopted street network. Um, seventh, creating opportunities for small shops, um, local shops and services. If there's a redevelopment scheme going on, is it forcing out local traders? Are they big units that don't have enough small units for local traders to come in because they're absolutely key to the success of the town and the attractiveness of people who use the town and visit it? And I think eighth, consider how maybe local traders traders can be cross-subsidized where necessary. The, the French, whose morning life at least revolves around the, bake, the bakers, the, the, the patisseries where the French shop for bread several times a day, there is a bylaw in Paris that uh, baker shops don't pay, don't pay rent. There's a, there's a financial subsidy to keep those bakers in place because if the baker goes, then lots of other shops that congregate around there also go. So are there local traders who should be encouraged and actually found a home in re redevelopment schemes. Um, ninth point is about local distinctiveness and uh, trying to avoid uniform solutions over quite big areas. If there's a big scheme, can different architects be brought in to take on different blocks and different parts of the design? Can it be broken down into, into greater diversity? 
Now this is the proposals for repairing part of, part of pool that I showed you as one of the problem, problem areas. And finally, I alluded to what's the, what's the, ma the maximum amount of town that can be, can be roofed in. It's something we're trying to determine, but many centres now have at least half the retail area roofed in, and it just feels not right. We can't put figures on it yet, but I think it is something to keep an eye on. And uh, shopping that is on the public realm with, a, with, with real streets uh, that are, that are well, well managed and maintained is the, the, the way forward for the greater parts of the town centre. So that's um, the checklist I have just run through of those 10, 10 design points. Um, just finally, my final slide I'll put on here. This uh, slide is taken from um, Urban Design Compendium 2, which was um, published recently. We prepared it for English Partnerships and the Housing Corporation, and, and it's, it's really about delivery. And we suggest there's five stages to delivery, so there's probably uh, people here who are working in policy section. Uh, if urban design principles are embodied in local policy, that is enormously helpful um, to the process. Um, second stage is design. Third stage, investment, development economics, the technical approvals that all schemes have to go through, and finally, management and maintenance. And the point of this slide is not to suggest that there's a sequential series to delivering um, a town centre scheme but that considerations further down, the line, ha further down the line have to feed back and inform earlier design stages and policy stages. So considerations of how town centres are managed and maintained have to feed back and inform policy decisions and design decisions. Thank you. <laughs>